Exodus chapter 20, and we're, tonight we're going to be looking at the 17th verse, the 10th commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. You shall not covet his Lexus or his Audi or, I'm sorry, that was in the Hebrew. That's in, see, that's in the Hebrew. So as we look into the 10th command, uh, we said before how that uh, the, the two parts of the commandment, loving God and loving others, or loving God and loving our neighbor. And uh, tonight, of course, we're in the second part, loving others. And then tonight we would say, you shall not covet. And we would say that the, the, the essential boil it down, what is he saying about not coveting? We should love others and not self, essentially. I'm not, you know, I mean, there is a healthy, we don't want to have some kind of, you know, sanctimonious self-hate. But at the same time, we don't want some self-worship going on, which is almost epidemic in our time. God calls on us to put others first, to care for others, to, uh, to, to love our neighbor. And as we said before, uh, loving our neighbor is, to, is, is explained to us in the commandments. We love our neighbor through not stealing, not, for, not uh, bearing false, false witness, not committing adultery, not, uh, and, and of course, putting our neighbor first before ourselves. So um, keep that in mind as we move along. Uh, we're going to break down the anatomy of one of the most vicious sins insidious sins in the Bible, and that is covetousness, covetousness. So the first thing we see, uh, or I would say, just to get us going on that, is that sexual sin we're all familiar with, and we all believe is uh, a serious problem, and, and obviously it is, it's maybe as much or more today than it's ever been. Uh, but sexual sins has slain its thousands but I would say to you that covetousness has slain its tens of thousands. Uh, this is a sin oftentimes not categorized as a sin. That's why I believe it is so prevalent uh, it, because it's one of those things that, that it's, it easy, easily poses as something else. And so we... we have to be very careful. Another thing is, and this is the first point, it's a command uh, to the heart. It's a command to the heart. Now, you know, as we're remembering, we've talked about, you'll, we've noted before that all the commandments were meant for the heart and the spirit of man. Uh, we said that this was the main understanding of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Our Lord was not correcting the commandments of God, but He was expounding them. So when He was teaching on, well, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. He wasn't saying, you have heard the commandments and they're wrong, let me tell you what they really mean. What Jesus was saying is, you have heard it said, or you have heard it taught, that the commandments mean only this. But I say to you, if you hate your brother, You've committed murder in your heart. So all the commandments are to the heart. We need to understand that you know, our Lord was pressing home to the legalists that the Word of God deals with the whole person and not merely outward conformity. In the 10th commandment, little exposition is needed though. It is from the beginning clearly and unmistakably a command to the heart and spirit of sinful man. This is a commandment, or, or a, a, it's a commandment to forbid a sin that happens here. You can only see it as it manifests itself, as you act on it. But even if you never act on it, even if I never act on the covetousness in my heart, it's still there. I still committed the sin, which was... The, the point that our Savior was making. 
So as we think about this, we need to understand that covetousness might be one of the most, it might be the most insidious sin other than you shall have no other gods before me. John tells us that, uh, that, that covetousness is as the sin of idolatry. The greatest sin would be to have another God before the Lord our God. But covetousness is like the sin of idolatry. Why? Because covetousness places self or the thing desired before God. So it is, it is a form of idolatry. So we start with the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And in a sense, we end with the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, or you shall not covet. You shall not covet. So what is covetousness? Uh, one of the best ways to fight sin, quite honestly, is to shed the light of God's Word on it. We have to expose it and allow the Word of God to, to uh, do its powerful work in us. The Spirit of God uses and does that spiritual surgery on us uh, to expose, but also to remove and to cut out and crucify and mortify, as, the, as Paul says, the deeds or the members of the flesh. So that's what we're, we're going to do here tonight. Uh, some of you may have heard me quote before Dr. Layman Strauss. I think before I said he pastored the Moody Church, but I don't believe he did pastor the Moody Church. And now that I think about it, it was, uh, I, I know it was the Calvary Baptist, but I can't remember now where it was. But anyway, Dr. Layman Strauss uh, had uh, a Bible radio program for many years. Uh, he was a great Bible teacher, did a lot of uh, commentaries and such. But he was a good man and, and uh, been with the Lord many years. But he had two things he said about coveting. He said, coveting is an inordinate desire to possess. In other words, there's that lust, that covet. Because there is that aspect of covetousness that we just want things. Notice what the text says. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You covet your neighbor's wife. You shall, covet, not, shall not covet his male servant or his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything other that he owns. Update that. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, his car, his education, his prestige, his job, his wife, his kids, or her, her husband. And on and on it goes. It's not just a male sin. You know, it goes either way. But it's a problem, isn't it? It's a problem with all of us, whether male or female. We all are struggling, whether, whether you're very disciplined in your life. I promise you, you're still dealing with covetousness in your heart. Some people are very uh, um, stoic in their lifestyle. They're able to cut out almost everything. They're minimalists. Uh, they're very disciplined. They're able to, to go without and do without and so forth. But, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're a very sparse person, you be careful because sometimes sparse people that work really hard tend to save a lot of money. And if you're not careful... Guess what now can become what you covet? You see, covetousness is insidious. It, there, is a, there is something about our, well, it's our fallen nature. You know, Calvin said we're idol factories. In other words, we just constantly make idols. We refuse to worship the true God. And, and how do we manufacture idols so easily? Covetousness. We want our children more than we want God. We want our money more than we want God. We want our health more than we want God. Can I say this to you? When the whole COVID thing hit, the first thing, when I saw how thoroughly and dramatically everyone fell to this, including pastors and the church, we have an idol. God has just revealed to us one of our greatest idols in the Western church. And that's our own health. Pastors who ought to have known better. Pastors who studied church history 
and church evangelism and, and, and should have known. They've studied the life of missionaries who, who, have, who put their lives on the line, who did ministry for Christ in dangerous places. They knew, but very few of them were pushing back. They just shut the church down. You know, and, and we shut ours down. I'm not trying to say that I did everything right, and I'm not saying that I shouldn't have done that. Uh, I'm just saying that I feel like that overall we, we prayed, we discussed it, we were sensitive. You know, we can't continue this. This is not long term. There's no way we can do this long term because the gospel has to go forward. The worship of God is essential. You know, and so, I mean, you've got to give everybody, I feel like, a little bit of leeway to figure out what's going on. But at the same time, somewhere in there, God has to come first. Somewhere in there, we have to say, well, we'll serve the Lord, and whatever happens to us, happens to us. Is it right for us to huddle up in our homes all the time and, and not gather for worship when Christians around the world might be huddled up in a barn or a cave or an underground basement or something like that to worship God because they're fearing for their lives? But we won't even come out of our house. We almost owe it to them to be at a little bit of risk, don't we? That's the way I felt about it. Then when you start looking throughout history and we see how science, medical science, nursing science, all of these things owe a lot of their existence to Christianity. Florence Nightingale, it was her Christian faith that pushed her to, to do what she did, which eventually turned into modern day nursing. You see how easy it is for this to happen? The anatomy of covetousness Strauss again, when we allow our wants to overrule us. That's the second point. Covetousness is at the root, we might say, of all sins. What did, what did uh, Satan want? He wanted God's position. He wanted the throne of God. Covetousness. So we often say it's pride. Well, and it was pride. But look how intimately pride and covetousness work together in that. And it always does. Covetousness always lays the groundwork for sin. And we're going to see that more and more as we go along. Romans chapter 7, verse 7 through 14. What shall we say then? That the law is sin? By no means. If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. But I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came and sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to, to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy. And the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. In other words, the law, thou shalt not covet, is not, is not evil, even though by it I am found guilty. But in fact, we, are, we as sinners, our flesh, our old lost nature is provoked by the law. In other words, the law says, don't cross this line. And you know what our sinful nature says? <laughs> you see? Is the law wrong? Was God wrong for saying you shall not covet? No. But sin in us feels compelled to break the commandment. And then, therefore, we are given death. Death by sin. And so this is the way it works. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. There it doesn't say money is evil. It says the love, the covetousness, the desire. 
desire, the inordinate desire to possess it is the root of all kinds of evil. We've all heard this, the quote, follow the money. You know, if, if you want to know what's going on in the world, if you want to know all the crookedness in politics or about anything else, it's true, isn't it? Many times, if you'll follow the money, you'll figure out what it's all about because of covetousness. That desire to obtain money, why? Because money is the gateway to so many of the desires of the flesh. What are the results of coveting? As I said before, other sins have slain their thousands, but coveting has slain its tens of thousands. Covetousness is a mark of the unregenerate life. The unregenerate life. In other words, those that are not born again. They're not regenerated by the Holy Spirit or reborn, recreated by the Holy Spirit. It is a, it is a, a characteristic of the lost. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 through 10, I wrote unto you, in an epistle, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of the world, or with the covetousness, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then you must need go out of the world. So what is he saying? He's saying, I wrote to you to tell you, don't keep company with extortioners, covetous, he says, but I'm not talking about lost people out there in the world. You'd have to leave the world to not hang around them. He's saying, I'm, I'm saying don't keep company with people who are in the church who live this kind of lifestyle. Who are claiming to know Christ and yet living this hypocritical lifestyle of blatant and open sin. Uh, he, here he's saying... These are known people, extortioners, fornicators, idolaters, you know, covetous people. In other words, everybody knows this about them. He says, now, I'm not telling you not to be around lost people like that. So in other words, that's the characteristic of being lost. You'd have to leave the world to get away from them. He's saying, I'm saying, stay away from so-called Christians that live this way. So it is a mark of the unregenerate life to... to to have covetousness. Now, without going too deeply into this, I would just say this, that uh, we might push this a little farther and say that a mark of the unsaved is that they do not fight. Uh, they do not fight covetousness. In other words, they just follow their passions. Whatever they feel like. If it feels good, do it. You know that whole thing? You know, we've seen that so many times. But the believer is called upon to mortify the deeds of the flesh. You say, well, what does mortify mean? You know, that's the old English word. The King James Version used that. What does that mean? Well, you've heard of a mortuary. <laughs> you, know, you, well, you know what you go there for. Mortify the deeds of the flesh literally means put them to death. Kill them. Like Jesus said, if your right arm offends you, cut it off. If your, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. In other words, you, you and I have to wage war against our own sin. He's not saying that we don't sin. He's saying that we don't settle for sin. We don't, always, we don't follow sin. This is why John says, if any of you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. But notice, that's a simple condition Assume true. If any of you sin. It doesn't say that we live a life of sin. He's saying that believers do sin. And when you do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So we don't just sit down and, sin and live in it. When we commit a sin, we repent. We go to the Lord. We seek forgiveness. We seek grace and strength to be obedient and to wage war against it. We resist temptation uh, uh, from Satan and from the flesh and from the world. Ephesians 5, 5 through 8. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral and pure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. 
Let no one deceive you with the empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So we see there's that covetousness, and it's linked with their sexual immorality. Uh, the King James called it whoremongering or in other words, fornicating, committing sexual sins of all sorts uh, with other people. Covetousness leads to broken relationships. Covetousness leads to broken relationships. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, For men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. That doesn't mean men as... Male, it means men and women in the last days. James, unfortunately though, this, this is a, it's a hallmark of the unsaved life. Unfortunately, as we saw earlier, it is also a sin of Christians. We commit it. James rebuked the people he was writing to. He says, verse, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Why do churches fight? That's what James says. Why are you guys quarreling and fighting in the church? Now here's the thing that all the church splits and all the church fights, this thing never got questioned. I, I, I can promise you. Because it's always my way or your way or their way or our way and, and no one's humbling themselves and saying none of us are seeking God. Uh, we just want our way. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have. You murder, you covet, and you cannot obtain. So you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You see, the problem is we haven't prayed. We haven't sought God. We, we, we are, we're following our covetousness. We're following our own desires, what we want. Instead of getting on our face and saying, God, what do, what do you want? And wait upon the Lord to show us and provide for us. The problem here is that we follow our passions instead of we following uh, prayer, God in prayer. Sabotaging another person in the workplace so that you can surpass them is not being a type A person. It's not utilizing your training or displaying the spirit of a winner. It's covetousness and it's evil. I had somebody one time, the person was uh, behaving themselves in a terrible way and, and mistreating others. And these were ministers. They were in the ministry uh, on staff. And uh, someone knew the guy that was doing it, and they knew his training was with a corporation, a Fortune 500 corporation uh, in America. And so this person said, uh, well, you know, he worked for such and such, and you know how they train. So I don't care how they train. If their training promotes covetousness, where we run over our neighbor and destroy another person so we can gain that, how dare we, number one, do it as a Christian? And how dare we, number two, bring it into the ministry? It's ungodly. It's covetous. It's lust. How many business, business friendships have been spoiled when it has been sacrificed on the altar of personal prosperity? Covetousness. How many friendships have been destroyed when one uses the other for personal gain? That's covetousness. How many marriages and lives have been wrecked because someone stole a spouse? Covetousness. You see, covetousness ruins and wrecks relationships. Why? Well, right here it is, isn't it? It puts ourself above others. Remember what Luther said? Our, our first neighbor is our spouse. Our first neighbor is our spouse or our children, or those closest to us. So when we're coveting, we're putting ourselves first, our passions, desires, the things we want, and what does that do then? 
It runs right over everyone around us and destroys relationships. We've all been through it, haven't we? We've all seen it. We've all seen it in action, and it's a terrible thing. Covetousness dampens your fiery love for Christ. Covetousness dampens your fiery love for Christ. Covetousness is not only a sin of the unregenerate. Christians may be guilty of this sin as well. Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness. Let your manner of life be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, not apathetic, but content. For he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Did you see how in that passage the writer to the Hebrews put opposite of discontentment the person of Christ? He says, be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So when I'm not content with what God has given me, and I, by that I don't mean you want to better yourself, you know, if you, there's, a, there's a way you can get a raise or move up in the company and do that without hurting other people. God's not talking about apathy here, where we just sort of park it in life and passivity. He's not talking about that. This is an active lust for something that, quite honestly, is against my neighbors. I want to take something from my neighbor uh, or from someone else. And so if we're not content with such things as we have, then what are we wanting? We want what somebody else has. We want what they have. If, they have, if I had what they have, then my life would be better. Whereas the writer in Hebrews says, you have Christ... For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So it does not matter how poor a Christian is. He or she is still wealthy. They have the Son of God. They're heirs to the kingdom of God. They're children of the King. They are going to inherit eternal life. They're going to rule and reign with Christ. That's what, what the writer is saying. Be content with what you have. If, you're, if God's providence, remember we talked about, if God's providence for your life is that you would have hardship and maybe not have as much as someone else, be content with those things and love Christ. Do not begrudge your neighbor that has more than you, understanding that you have what God wants you to have and that you're an heir to the, to the kingdom of God. And to dislike what God has given us is to dislike Himself, Christ Himself. And so we have to be careful about that. One of the easiest ways to covet is to, is to say, well, why do they get this and I don't? Because that's not fair. God never said He was fair. He said He's just. But thank, thank the Lord He's also merciful because if He was only just, we'd all go to hell. But He's also merciful. And so in His mercy, He's reached out to, to us. None of us deserve it. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it any more than the lost person down the street. It's just in His love, for whatever reason, in His counsels, He has loved us and brought us to Himself. And we pray that He'll do the same for them. James chapter 4, verses 2 through 5, which is the, the section I've mentioned earlier. But now we'll elaborate on it a little bit. He says, you desire and you do not have, you, you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly. And why do they ask wrongly? And boy, this, is, this hurts a lot of our prayers right here. To spend it on your passions. If God would just let me win the lottery, the church would never need another dime. This is what James is saying. You know, we pray and we ask for things, but oftentimes what are we doing? We're just, we're just feeding our covetousness. We're just going to God and saying, God, will you give me the stuff I want? Instead of praying for the glory of God, praying for the kingdom of God, praying for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see the Godward focus of the prayers? 
rather than the me focus. Uh, and, 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 and don't get me wrong, I, I know God tells us to cast our cares upon Him. We should pray for ourselves and we should pray for others. But there is a difference when we begin to spend an inordinate amount of time on ourselves and we miss the purposes of God. And so often, that's the content of the prayer times and prayers of God's people in the church. Is it for ourselves or for others? But very rarely for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. Very rarely that sin would be put down, that, that revival would come to the church, that the lost would be saved. He goes on, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? If you're friends with the world and you want all the things that the world wants, how can you convince yourself that you're a friend with God? When stuff consumes our life, when self consumes our life, we're saying Christ is not enough. But James says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Ch cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And we're back to double-mindedness, aren't we? We talked about that the other day and on Wednesday night. 1 John chapter 5, verse 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Covetousness leads to departure from the faith. Unhindered covetousness will always lead us away from God. It will cause us to apostatize. It will cause us to, to leave the faith. We will have to choose Christ or what I want. Covetousness always pushes us to abandon the faith because it is at its heart idolatry. Another reason why this homosexuality, so-called homosexual Christianity, is not true. You're, they're following their passions, their lust, their covetousness. I'm not, throwing, I'm not throwing out names there. I'm just saying that's what's going on. And if we follow that, it always leads to apostatizing from the faith. A departure from the faith. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 through 10. But they that would be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, of course, that's with the love of money. But what are we talking about here? We're talking about covetousness. We're talking about, what's another word for covetousness? Greed. Lust. Strong desire. And we can see how easily this goes into the sexual realm. Okay? And also, of course, money, stuff. Whatever, we're going to get to that in a second. But do you see what, what Paul says in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy there? They pierce themselves through with many troubles and perdition, departing from the faith. This is dangerous stuff. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. There's a Greek that displays the sin of covetousness. The fable goes something like this. When a man was told that he would be granted anything he wished, provided that his neighbor would receive double. Not being able to bear the thought of his neighbor receiving more than he, he wished to lose an eye. This is the sinfulness of man. This is how we really are, quite honestly. Apart from the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, the gospel of Christ, this is who we are. We want to win. We want the stuff. We want the money. We want the power. We want it. And that makes us idolaters. Categories, well, you can write them down if you want. Possessions, stuff, people. There are famous people that have to have, to have bodyguards, especially women actors, but I'm, I'm sure it's true of some of the men actors as well. But, you know, musicians, actors, you know, famous people. Uh, people that are known for their, their looks, 
And many of them have to be guarded almost 24 hours a day. Why? Because some people, driven by lust and the covetousness of their heart, want that person. Now, we're tempted to say it's psychological. And there's uh, maybe some truth in, in some of that, but we can't, we can't sanctify it and say, well, it's just, you know, he's just mental or, or whatever. Sin is sin. And, and it is a sin. Possessions, people, position, accomplishments, spirituality, virtually anything. There are those that we say, well, spirituality? Yeah. There's, there are pastors and theologians, writers, church leaders, Sunday school teachers, deacons, church members throughout church history have done one another in. Why? Like James said, you fight and you war among one another because you desire, you covet, you want. Now they want the, the reputation. They want the status. They want the recognition. They want others to look up to them or, or whatever. That's covetousness. And quite honestly, virtually anything could fit in the blank, couldn't it? So what is the cure? Well, first, confession. We saw that in James chapter 4, verse 5 through 10. Confession of sin. He says, confess it, he says. And, uh, and he says, draw nigh to God and God will draw nigh to you. In other words, repent of this lifestyle, this lust, this desire, this coveting. And you draw nigh to God, and God will draw near to you. So confession. Lawful coveting. Did you know that there is a, you can covet? There is a way that you and I can covet. So often this is the case. And Satan would have us, our flesh would have us, the world would have us to covet what we cannot have. But ignore what we can have. We can covet... Good things. We can desire the good things of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts. God says, in other words, seek, desire, pursue, want. That God would give you gifts and abilities to, for what? For the, for others. For the upbuilding of the church. Did you see that? Not so that, you know, that we can get all the fanfare and we can, you know, be up front necessarily. People serve God all over the place in the church and don't get, they're not up front. Strongly desire the best gifts. Desire the gifts so that you can minister to brothers and sisters in Christ. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 Blessed are they which do hunger. And thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The strongest desires known to man. Hunger and thirst. Stick someone out in the desert for very long, and very few things will matter to them other than water and food. Strongest desires in the human body. And yet, what does God say? Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God. So we can hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God. We have God's approval for that. Psalm 19, verse 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We can desire that our labors be pleasing to God. We can desire that, that what we do would bring God honor and glory. We can desire, uh, we can have desiring under control in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Temperance means self-control. In other words, to be controlled by the Spirit is to, be, is to be under the control of the Spirit. There is nothing wrong with pies or cakes or ice cream. But if our desire for sweets gets out of control, it can become lust. In other words, we can desire things. We can desire to move up in the company. We can desire a, some blackberry cobbler. When it's the guidance and control of the Holy Spirit. Remember how I think I said it was 
Wednesday night, I was quoting my professor. He said, hold everything in an open hand. God can put it in and God can take it out. And as we said this morning, Job says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God's not saying don't desire better for your family. Don't, don't desire something that's good or what God is saying, be under the control of the Spirit. Don't let your desires run rampant. Don't let them be out of control where they turn to covetousness and lust. And remember, one of the key factors of covetousness is, I want what my neighbor has. I want what my neighbor has. I mean, a lot of times, I'll tell you one of the, one of the worst things that I've ever experienced in, in this. Every now and then I get a text and it'll have a big bowl of ice cream. And it's from Billy. And he's like, I'm eating ice cream. Are you? And, and I'm like, he's tempting me. He's trying to make me lust and, and want what, what my brother has. <laughs> and it works. <laughs> he's testing my faith. Oh, man, that's kind of a joke we got going with each other. If I get, I, I do it to him, too. You know, I was at the beach, and I, we were at the ice cream shop, and I took a picture and sent it to him. I said, look what I'm doing. So I'm guilty of it, too. You know, it's not just Billy. But desire under control. God put the desire in us, the ability to desire. But he wants all that to be under control the, of the Holy Spirit. Then desiring God, the greatest thing we can desire. Desiring God. Psalm 42, verses 1, 1 and 2, which is really kind of our theme verse here uh, at Coggins. As the heart pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul after Thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Do you feel the powerful desire there the heart the baby deer have you ever seen i'm not a not a deer hunter but you know i love animals and stuff you ever seen a deer that's run they'll literally like a dog they'll hang their tongue out have you guys seen that i'm the only one oh, well i know jimmy has he knows all about it he knows more well way more about it than i do well that's what he's talking about as the as the young deer pants after the water brooks so pants my soul after thee, O God. You feel the passion? You feel the, this, this, the desire, the strong desire? My soul thirsts for God. Not for a statue. Not for religion. Not for pomp and circumstance. Not for woke religion. For the living God. When shall I come and appear? Before you. You see that? There's, there's the proper expression of holy desire, earnest, powerful desire. In there. Cultivating commitment. So, confession, lawful coveting, cultivating commitment and contentment. Psalm 37 All that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. The little, let's hear that together. The little that the righteous have is better than the of the wicked. Cultivate contentment in our life. We should resist the desire to lust for more. More just for more sake. How much, how much, how much will be enough? More. That's, that's covetousness. We should be content. We should cultivate a heart of contentment, of thankfulness. John 16, 6, 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. You see how Christ says, I'm everything you need. If you come to me, you should be content. I'm the bread of life. I'm the water of life. John 4, 14, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him 
shall never thirst. But the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Here it is again. It's always coming out into others, out into others. And then confidence in God. So confession, lawful coveting, con- cultivating contentment and confidence in God. Matthew 6.33, but seek you first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Is God providing or am I grabbing? The battle with covetousness, if we confess it as a sin and not justify it, if we lawfully covet and desire the things God wants us to desire, and if we cultivate a a spirit of contentment in our life, a thankful spirit in our life, and we look to God with confidence that He's our provider, uh, that He'll give us all that we need and uh, an everlasting life on top of it, then that goes a long way to fighting the war against covetousness. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to our latest video. Go ahead and click that little thumb so you can like that video, as well as on the bottom right hand corner, click that little bell to subscribe and receive notifications. Thank you again so much for tuning in, supporting our video ministry here at Cognitive Church.